Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the second talk of the second series, which is now on observations and the question whether we can see some bit of quantum gravity. And after David Mattingly's great introduction um, during the last seminar, we now start sort of a more detailed um, deep dive into particular phenomenology topics. And I think it's very suitable to have the first topic just be the question whether gravity has to be quantized at all and whether we can somehow find experimental evidence for this um, sort of first crucial question about quantum gravity. And for this talk and also for um, the following talks of this series, now we switch to a kind of new and experimental format and please give us feedback on that as well. Um, where we have two speakers in each seminar. Each speaker will speak for 30 minutes. Um, and we have, of course, there can be brief questions if you don't understand a particular point. But then we keep discussion among the speakers and among all of you um, for after the two talks. And so with that, it's a really great pleasure today to have Sugato Bose here from University College London and Markus Aspelmeier from the University of Vienna. And I think they are both very distinguished ex experts on the topic of this question of whether quantum or whether gravity has to be quantized and whether we can see that. And especially together, they will um, be able to give us an encompassing overview of both theory and experiment. And so hopefully they'll be able to answer all of your questions. And so um, we will start with Sugato's talk. And so whenever you're ready, you can start your screen share. It's a great pleasure to have both of you here. Okay, so let, let, me, let me start by thanking um, Aaron and, and the co-organizers for this uh, nice invitation. And I see this is a very well attended uh, forum. So thanks uh, indeed. Um, and uh, also, it's it's a it's a very good format that they have planned. Uh, so I will concentrate particularly mostly on the background assumptions on 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 why we think a particular experiment, particular class of experiments, will prove the quantum nature of gravity, and kind of a schematic idea of how such an experiment may proceed. Okay. So <clears throat> let me start. Uh, by, by telling roughly the outline is going to firstly uh, the the motivation here okay so what what are what what is it we want to prove here okay so what we want to prove is the quantum origin of the Newtonian interaction itself okay Newtonian interaction of course known for long okay and then after uh, general relativity it is revised uh, right to to be causal in nature and so that is the kind of Newtonian interaction which is not Newtonian interaction a, a la Newton the instantaneous action at distance but Newtonian interaction in the you know, weak field limit of general relativity. That is the kind of Newtonian interaction uh, we can uh, we are speaking about here in our experiment, and and that is whose quantum nature we are going to uh, investigate. Like this experiment should be able to prove. Okay, what what the experiment I'll, I'll propose. Okay, now uh, of course when we want to say something is uh, quantum, okay? So I must first declare out what I am regarding as classical, okay? Uh, if you extend the definition of classicality sufficiently, you can encompass a lot of quantum attributes. So, so we, I, I, are tried, I will define what I mean by classical and, and that will be very, um, you know, uh, just like how you define classical electromagnetic fields in undergraduate, okay? So that's literally that definition. Then I will clarify why if you had a quantum matter, so matter suppose is, is quantized and you have proven it, but you had only classical gravity according to this definition of classicality, then it cannot create entanglement. Okay, And, and for this, we will use something called LOCC, local operations and classical communication, which cannot entangle uh, from quantum information theory. Thank you. Next, I will go to a brief description of a schematic experiment, okay, which uh, does that and 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 some give some order of magnitude, uh, you know, numbers to show why it uh, may work, okay. Um, depending on time, I'll I'll tell a little bit 
relate a little bit to earlier ideas or, or, or what, what was the advance that uh, we made. And uh, also, uh, uh, particularly on two points, I might uh, mention something, okay? So uh, that how to, how to uh, make uh, gravity dominant and also how to manage some noise coming from gravity itself, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so this is the rough outline, right? Now, um, right, so I proceed. Now, uh, of course, uh, it's an important question whether gravity is at all quantum, okay, because we don't have any empirical proof uh, to date, okay. And of course, the first natural tendency would be to test energy quantization, that the gravitons come as packets of H bar omega. That would be the most natural thing to think about, okay. However, I want to emphasize that is extraordinarily hard, okay. There are some recent papers indeed uh, on, on that uh, area. But for example, if you do just rough calculation, uh, 100 hertz, uh, you know, uh, quanta will have a nano electron volt energy or a nano Kelvin deposition of energy. And, and that has to be detected by a detector, which is, uh, you, know, you know, what kind of big detectors are needed, for example, to detect gravitational waves, okay? So it's an extraordinarily difficult task, okay? The experiment that I'm going to describe is no easy, uh, thing either okay but but maybe some of that hardness uh, you know marcus will address however i think it is probably easier than trying to detect the energy quantization okay now uh, another way people might want to go about as as happened in the case of electromagnetism is to detect higher order corrections to the potential okay h bar dependent correction but just because these are h bar dependent corrections you see they are you know 10 to the power minus 34 times uh, smaller unfortunately uh, so so we are and, and and often often also g square okay so so we so so we have uh, not much hope of detecting them. So we have to somehow try to uh, sidestep this problem and, and we have to try to use the strongest thing that we know, which is the Newtonian interaction. Okay, that's what we have to aim to use. Okay, and here what we will use is this entanglement conveying ability. Okay, so I contend that entanglement conveying ability is a non-classical property and I will, I will demonstrate why I think so. Okay. And, and that is the kind of non-classicality we will demonstrate. Okay? Uh, here may be a word of caution that when you want to prove something is quantum, uh, it is not immediately easy because uh, you know quantum mechanics is a lot of things which come all together. So the whole Hilbert space essentially, right? Uh, so, so when we want to prove something is quantum, we essentially prove that it is not classical in one way or other. And this is one way of showing that it's not classical. So we will loosely be calling non -class, a particular non-classicality. Yeah, we are demonstrating. And then since classical objects cannot do it, only non-classical thing we know so far is quantum. So we say it's quantum. Yeah. <clears throat> That's the logic. Okay, so I go back to very um, standard. I, I start with a very standard thing which people do in uh, you know in in quantum computing. Okay, people make two uh, quantum bits interact and have a kind of entangling quantum gate between them. Okay, and what happens to be one of the most popular, if not the most popular, technique for doing so. Okay, is to have a bus linking the qubits, okay? They could be distant. And this bu bus is typically a quantum field, okay? We concentrate it to focus on a particular qubit. So we use a, you know, like a microwave bus or a phonon mode, okay? And then there is an interaction, okay? So this kind of interaction, uh, the HI here is very much like a vertex in, uh, in QED or, or any quantum field theory. While two such things together, give this to the second order, give this effective interaction between the qubits, okay? Here, what is worth noting is that if you see at the very bottom of the, the page, there is a flip-flop interaction between the qubits, S minus, S plus, S plus, S minus, between distant qubits, mediated by this bus, okay? However, there is something which has not been written down there, okay? Because it's an identity. Okay, and that identity is uh, actually a commutator of the field there. So if the field was not a quantum object, you would not have this part of the interaction at all. Okay, so if the bus is not quantum, if it's a classical system, you will not have this second order interaction. It's the second term 
uh, in the Dyson series, for example, of the unitary, if you if you take, okay, and and still it is very like it does not appear in the interaction explicitly s plus uh, s minus interaction of the two objects. There's no no evidence of that mediator, right? But that that mediator is essential to make the interaction. Okay. <clears throat> This has been the oldest way of doing quantum gates. So this, this, uh, uh, this Chinese authors, this, this experiment was done by Harosh very soon after that in 1990, uh, in early 2000, I think, okay. One of the classic experiments and all ion trapped quantum computing these days, 90% 90, 90 of it follows the same methodology with the ion bus. Here I have, I have written in a slightly different way here, just for you to see it from a different picture. So what happens? So here the quantum field is replaced by uh, you know intermediate phonon modes, okay, where these E and G stands for states of an atomic qubit, okay. So these intermediate states, okay. So it is again a second order perturbation which gives an effective Hamiltonian between the qubits. In that effective Hamiltonian, this has gone, okay. It's nowhere there, the mediator, okay. But the effective Hamiltonian comes because intermediate states are populated, okay? And, and they are not just the original states, original number states N, which the, the phonon mode was in, it could be N plus one, N plus two, all the kinds of other things are there, okay? So there is a superposition, okay? So it's very much a quantum bus which is needed. If you do not allow these superpositions, it, it will not create uh, entanglement. It will not be a coherent interaction of this form, okay? So, so we asked the same question for gravity, of course, so this is, of course, we used a single mode, okay, but in, in three space when you have, uh, you know, two objects, they interact through all, all, the, all the modes uh, in uh, around, yeah, and, and that is nothing but the, the tree level diagram, okay, uh, the tree level Feynman diagram, okay, and, and we know, uh, like the Coulomb force definitely originates that way, we also know all forces uh, in uh, nuclear physics, okay? So the forces of strong and the weak interactions, uh, you know, originate that way. So the question is, does gravity happen in the same way? Okay, is there a quantum mediator? Is it exactly the same nature as, as these other forces? Okay, that's the question, okay? Now, um, uh, so some observations so far, we do not have evidence of that, okay? It could as well be the thing in the right-hand diagram, okay? It could be a classical channel, okay? Where you say, for example, measure one of the masses, okay? And, and so there is a theory, in fact, like that, a valid theory made by, uh, you know, Jacob Taylor and others. So you can measure one of the masses and then act on another mass according to the distance and voila, you have one by R potential, okay? you will have some stochastic noise and stuff along with it because of the measurement, but nonetheless, you can construct such a thing, okay? So we, current experiments where we just measure the force between two objects cannot tell these two things apart, okay? How do you know whether it's the left-hand thing, whether there's something quantum being exchanged or the right-hand thing where you just, uh, you know, have a classical interaction, okay? So this is what we want to set apart, okay? Now, here a little bit on terminology. Okay, uh, so actually there are two points I want to emphasize here. First of all, you may have in your mind a quantum theory of gravity, which is formulated in a very different way. Okay, of course, in UV theories of quantum gravity could be very different. Okay, it could be string theory, it could be loop quantum gravity. Okay, it could be some other approach, other innovative approach. However, when you come to the low energy infrared limit, I contend that any theory should give a description like the left-hand type with a, with a virtual graviton being exchanged to create an interaction. Okay? You might have a very different picture, like in canonical quantization, you might think in a very different way, but nonetheless, all pictures should, this should be an equivalent picture to them, okay? Because it gives the same results. In low energy limit, if you can think of the Coulomb interaction in this way, which we know is a valid way to think about, so you should be also be able to think low energy gravity, whatever your high energy UV approach, in this way in the IR, okay? That's one of the points. The other, and, and, and a re related point is that just this tree level exchange, okay? Sometimes people call it the classical force, okay? Now, I, I completely disagree with this term. This term has been used for, by very long by many people, okay? But you can see it is a quantum thing being exchanged, right? So you cannot, 
cannot really call it classical, okay? Um, so uh, it, it just because it was measured historically much before quantum mechanics, if you had that great precision, perhaps you could measure higher order corrections to the forces like due to loops and everything, okay? So, so it does not, it, it's just our ability to measure has been limited to the Newtonian one before quantum. It does not mean that it's the Newtonian interaction uh, it fundamentally is, is classical, right? So this is this is another point I want to emphasize. Okay, so now uh, the assumptions. Okay, so uh, so there are two assumptions we need to make. Okay, uh, very coming back to very basic level, quite theory independent assumptions. One is that interactions in nature are local, so there's locality. Okay, so I don't mind some smearing of the locality, some non-local scale which is very small. Okay, but definitely we assume locality over the um, distance in which we are going to separate uh, two apparatus, okay? And, and two masses, and those we will show that they get entangled, okay? Uh, so over that kind of separation, the nature is local, okay? So, so the interactions are local. So why do we do that, okay? Because that necessitates the mediator, okay? So essentially what we need is for there to be a gravitational field or a curvature, okay? We need, need that thing, okay? So we do not, uh, our, our thing will not work if we assume that the mass acts on a distant mass uh, at a distance, okay? So we need the field, okay? Or curvature, okay, equivalently. So, so if we need that, okay, then the way to justify that, that, that's why I'm using relativity here. You might be surprised that to prove something is quantum, why do we need to assume relativity? This we are doing mainly to justify the presence of a field in a much stronger manner. So relativistic causality means things are local. Okay? That's the first assumption. And the second one is rather than assumption, it's more like a definition, what we mean by classical, okay? So what we mean by classical is that here is that matter, this JJ is the matter, can be as quantum as you wish, yet the field that it sources must be classical, okay? So, it, so that is, that is our, but, and that can happen with different probabilities, okay? With various PJ, we can have AJ, okay? And so, so though it may be quantum, what it creates, is really a number in every point in space time. Okay, so that is what we mean by classical. Okay, so every point, the, the tensor at every point is described purely by classical bits. Okay, you can by a spring of bits, so arbitrary precision. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you take these two assumptions, okay, the first one, the locality, means that you can do only local operations on system. Okay, and the second one, which is uh, that uh, the, the field is classical, means that you can do only classical communication. Okay, I cannot create an entangle uh, uh, entanglement with you, any of you, because I'm speaking through a classical channel. It's as simple as that. Okay, now, uh, so so so, but but the, just you can see a toy example. So if if some if whatever the state of a quantum bit here. It created something at a distance. Okay, it's quite, uh, you know. Um, so, so if it is a classical field, that will just cause a unitary operation there. So, uh, uh, initially, product state will remain product. Okay, so it will separable, it will separable. Okay, and this very easily generalizes to more complicated uh, scenarios. Okay, it's, it's very well known in the past in quantum information that local operation and classical communications cannot entangle. You can prove that for any starting state which is not entangled. So, so then, so, so this is, this is all the justification I'm going to give that if you have local, if you have a scenario where you have local operations and classical communication and local operations is justified by the locality of physical interactions in nature, indirectly justified by relativity and classical communication justified by the fact of the definition of a classical field that it may be a vector or tensor, whatever at a point, but it's just described by, uh, you know, uh, to arbitrary precision by bits, okay? Now, how are we going to do it, okay? So um, what we can do is we can create, um, take two, two matter wave interferometers, okay? 
and we can have two masses, we create a spatial superposition, a superposition between delta x on this mass and delta x on that mass, okay? So masses M1, M2, center separated by distance D. We call them left and right, L and R. You can think of them as two spatial states of a qubit, okay? L and R are dichotomic states like qubit states, okay? So this is very much like an, like an Ising interaction effectively or, or quite similar to it, okay? Now what happens is, we are going to directly use the Newtonian interaction, okay? So I have already told you that the Newtonian interaction is not direct action at a distance, but we know a formula which acts, works very well in low energies, okay? And that is the formula we are going to use. So we are going to use the effective Hamiltonian. We are not going to bother about the, the intermediary which has been eliminated, okay? For calculations, this is the best way to do it, okay? So obviously when masses are close they are, or far, depending on their distance, they have different, energies, that configuration has different energies, so they have different rates of phase evolution, okay? As you can see, this will be d minus delta x in the denominator, that will be d plus delta x in the denominator and so forth, okay? So these L, 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 R, R, L, and R, R have different rates of evolution. So you can rewrite the state by taking some part of the phase common. And then here you can see, you see if you take L common, what you have here, L2 plus I delta phi L, R, and if you take R common, you have I delta phi R L. These two are not the same, okay? As soon as these are not the same, the state you cannot factorize out and it's, a, it's an entangled state, okay? So the gravitational interaction entangles these states. In particular, they can even become what is the highest entangled state of two qubits when these phases sum to pi, okay? Now, we are to see, to, to understand clearly the orders of magnitudes, okay, I'm going to uh, ask you to imagine uh, a very uh, challenging limit, okay, in, in which all the distances have become very large, okay, this delta x particularly has become much larger than the closest approach, the d minus delta x, the closest approach is really tiny, so that only one phase dominates. Okay, this is the kind of thing we have when we have what is called a control Z gate in, uh, you know, in, in quantum information. So only one of the one set of state uh, evolves. Okay, that has the relevant energy. Every other energy is kind of zero. Okay, but we what is this closest? So we are prohibited a little bit on this distance due to electromagnetism. Okay. What is the prohibition? The prohibition is as follows, that even if you did manage to take neutral objects, yeah, and bring them extremely close, okay, uh, there would still be an electromagnetic interaction, which is due to, you know, vacuum induced dipoles in, in both the, uh, you know, both the masses, okay. So this is the Casimir interaction. And if you take the ratios of the Casimir interaction to gravity, then you will find, so of course you have to use quite dense masses there, okay, density is rho. MP, you can't do much about because it's Planck, it is the mass Planck, it's a constant of nature. So pretty much the distance is the only flexible thing, okay? Once you go to solids, densities are, are there, but you probably can get at most one order. So, um, sorry, so, so this is from slide from some other <laughs> conference, but anyway, so you need to be 200 microns separate, okay? To, to have the, the gravity dominate on the Cassini, okay? Uh, then uh, what happens is, uh, so what we found is then if you use microspheres, micron size spheres and ash, uh, uh, allowed uh, one second of time, create a superposition of 100 microns, you could have this phase of the order of unity, okay? So you could entangle to that extent, okay? Uh, you can, so why does this happen? Why is this effect so strong? Because people often think that gravity, nothing strong will come out of gravity. Okay, gravity is such capital G is so weak, but there are two ways of thinking. Okay, the, first of all, um, you know that the masses have increased quite a bit. Okay, they are till 10 to the power minus 14 kg, but they are many orders, so they are 10 to the power 13 atoms. Okay, atomic mass uh, units. Okay, so it's and then capital G is fought by H bar in the denominator because the entanglement is happening from a quantum phase after all. Okay. Another way to think about it is, as Carlo and uh, Marius uh, wrote, is that actually it's uh, the masses are become comparable to Planck mass. And uh, here you can see the distance light uh, will travel 
in the time of the experiment, one second is much larger than our closest separation. Okay? So that's another way of seeing why the magnitude can be so large. Okay? Uh, maybe I will skip this point. Feynman already made uh, this kind of point in, in uh, verbal discussions in Chapel Hill long ago in 1957. Uh, however, his methodology was slightly different. It was entanglement was not through a phase accumulation. He was telling to move another mass. That is a very slow process. 10 to the power minus 16 meter per second square. Another mass will move one way or other, depending on one mass. And then there's also the fact that he did not tell, I mean, entanglement itself was not so popular at that time. He did not tell which aspect of the experiment you have to measure. Okay, so obviously he probably meant that you have to measure both the masses in combined bases and two particle interferometry is nothing but entanglement detection. So in some sense, yeah, we need to detect entanglement. That's what we uh, spelled out, okay. Now, maybe I'll skip this slide in, in uh, case of time. I'll just tell a little bit of how you will create such a superposition because we do uh, just schematically, we do face a big obstacle here, okay. People have done, superpositions with using bucky balls and stuff. But when you go to masses as large as ours, there is this problem that the typical thing you use, such as a beam splitter, becomes prohibitively difficult, okay? Because um, a large mass doesn't tunnel so much distance, okay, that we need, okay, these hundreds of microns, okay? So one, one way, okay, to do is to use uh, an, an ancillary quantum system such as a spin and use the starn garlock method, okay? So you create a superposition of up plus down, okay? Then you have a starn garlock field, it splits. At appropriate time, you flip spins to slow down, break, speed up. Then you flip again to break and come to a you know, coincidence, okay? This is called Ramsey interferometry. Okay, and it has been done with atoms, this kind of thing, okay? Now, all we say is that you need to do the similar thing with two things adjacent with a slightly extra step, okay? So at, at some step, you can also map from those nuclear spins to some, uh, to some of those electronic spins, which cause the star and to something where you park. This is like nuclear spins. They, then the, the superpositions will fall straight down at, beside each other and cause this phase accumulation which will cause the entanglement, okay? But these spins by which we are creating and ending the interferometer have an extra advantage, okay? That's the beauty of it. So if you did it in this way, the central spin and up and down, we go, we replace all our previous left and right now with left up and right down because that's how the spins move in the interferometer. You do the same maths, the masses of course both come back to the same state. So they are not entangled anymore, the center of masses of the things. But what is entangled, what becomes entangled are the spins embedded in the masses. Okay? Now, there are varieties of spins which people can uh, measure very well in quantum information. People have done this, you know, Bell inequality experiments, for example. So there is, this is called an entanglement weakness. If you measure it and if its value is less than one, then the whole thing is entangled. So, Gato? I should stop, right? No, no, okay. you have five more minutes because okay, I, okay. I spent five minutes in the beginning. Right, right. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, I probably require less than five minutes here. So, so, essentially, the thing is that spin correlation functions will set, uh, can be measured to measure that entanglement. Okay. So, if you do this kind of uh, spin based intervention, that's why we call this spin uh, entanglement weakness. Okay. There could be other ways to entangle, other possible states to entangle, but then you have to detect them in other ways. Okay. Now, uh, one obvious question people used to ask us in initial talks, so we did a calculation, is that uh, can you bring them a bit closer if you put a screen? So this is a, utilizing one difference between gravity and electromagnetism. Of course, electromagnetism is our only enemy, main enemy, okay? And uh, then that you have to fight by, so, so the gravity has a huge advantage. Gravity cannot be screened while electromagnetism can be screened. So you just put everything in a Faraday box, okay? One of them in a Faraday box, so that we have a partition in the middle, but it's all not a panacea because you have to do an interferometry, right? So you have to split things and bring back. Interferometry is not just splitting, it's also bringing back, 
right to interfere and that for that challenge you you cannot do the the magnetic force cannot be overcome by the the force uh, the casimir force okay so so we found you can do some improvements we even reduce the mass we try to detect a very small amount of entanglement okay at these phase levels the entanglement weakness is proportional to entanglement so 0 0.01 means that you have to do one by 10,000 measurements, right? Because short noise, one by root 10, okay? So, so anyway, there these are the parameters. You can have 10 micron superpositions, 10 to the power minus 15 kg mass per thing, but still one second time, which is large, okay? Now, uh, when I say gravity cannot be screened, that is good. You can screen here, but gravity cannot be screened is also bad, okay? So even tiny, uh, gravitational accelerations from other masses around will uh, will create trouble. Okay, so Andre Grossard noticed this uh, first, and and then we we our paper is also published now. So we we uh, we managed to see how this uh, at least find one way of how this can be you know controlled. Okay, so the the picture is this. Okay, so I'll not go into the details. So essentially, you use the equivalence principle. So again, use one aspect of gravity where you let the object fall, freely fall, and, and then you will cancel all the random accelerations due to external masses. Okay? What you will, of course, not still cancel are um, you know, the curvature effects. Right, this the true gravity will not cancel. Okay? For that, you need a little bit of an isolation uh, regime. Okay? So you need uh, humans to not come close then, you know, some five meters or something, depending on how they're moving. So it was very easy to use data from, you know, LIGO things, okay, for acceleration noise, which you can convert to curvature noise, okay. You also need to be careful about pressure and temperature so that random, so you really have a better and better free fall, okay. So I don't go into those details. So I just would like to end here by, uh, maybe driving home one point, which I have never made in a talk before, this is the first time I, I making this point, that when you are using this LOCC uh, uh, argument, you kind of are not using this picture so much. Okay, you are quite agnostic to how what your qubit states are. Okay, as long as you have justified that there's a field, there's a mediator. Okay that's quantum if these are entangled, okay? It's for your procedure, you need specific states yeah, to measure, right? But, but yeah, the, the argument LOC is when you're using, the quantum is proof quite agnostic to how the states are, okay? While if you want to argue from this and quantum is through other, through a picture, like you're superposing curvatures here plus there, okay? There you're drawing a picture of an intermediate situation, okay? But who knows quantum intermediate situations? No one knows in middle of a quantum interferometry what happens, right? We should not ascribe, if, if, okay, we don't need to ascribe a picture here, that's the point, okay? If you use this LSC logic, okay? So with that, I will um, end here, okay? And uh, I'll let uh, Marcus take over. Okay? Yeah, thanks Sugato for the beautiful talk. Um, I'll clap for everyone. And um, while Sugato maybe can unshare and Marcos can share, are there um, questions in particular on the, whether there's an understanding that you might miss or if there's a direct question, I think we have time for, to take one. If no one else has a question, I would just really quickly because, so mm -hmm. did I understand the last point right that Actually, you're saying we might be able to measure that gravity is quantum, but it might not tell us anything about what quantum theory of gravity it actually is. No, that is true. That that is true from from the beginning already of of, okay. of my talk. Yeah. So what I'm telling is whatever is the quantum theory of gravity. First part was let it should come to the the tree level diagram kind of picture in the in the IR in mm -hmm. some way or other in whatever picture you use. But but the the thing is that what I'm telling is even what states we have prepared the masses in. Okay, we don't we are quite agnostic to that. While if you were telling that our Thing proves that you have a quantum superposition of curvatures, which is on, also one way to think of it, then you are kind of putting in a, a picture there, okay? So you don't need that. What I'm saying is that the, the LOCC arguments even does not need that picture, yeah? As long as you can create entanglement, the things mediator must be quantum. 
There's also um, a raised hand by Steve. So Steve, if you want to. Yeah, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, just a question. Is there a truly consistent theory that you have in mind where you couple uh, quantum matter to classical gravity that is your sort of, you know, your, what you're testing that that is not the correct theory? I'm just wondering whether you really have what the status is of giving a consistent that's true, that's true. Yeah, so that is not my expertise. So, but some of my colleagues uh, have such theories. Okay, so uh, I, I mentioned one by uh, Jacob Taylor and Co. But there is also um, one by um, you know my colleague Jonathan Oppenheim, for example, at UCL. So there are theories. Now, uh, when you say consistent, this is going. Uh, beyond my knowledge. So, so of course it is consistent in the sense that it wouldn't cause something drastic like faster than light signaling and all that. Okay, so they are stochastic theories which couple. So, so essentially the mass superposition collapses and you couple. So it's still a classical gravity uh, because stochasticity is not, not, is it not, not quantum. But, but on the other hand, if you think of more general things that whether whether they are fully diffeomorphism invariant or even Lorentz invariant, that that is going beyond my expertise to tell whether there is a so so if no one can ever construct a theory which is uh, fully consistent in those large uh, or those last two scenarios, then I would say that it probably follows without experiment that gravity is quantum. Right. Okay, but but at the moment, uh, so at least whether they have fully finished the point, I don't know, but but there are people who have such theories, yeah. Right, okay, thanks. And then there's another raised hand by Marco. Um, if you can keep this very short, otherwise maybe we can keep it for the, for the discussion. Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my question is uh, simple. Uh, basically, if you detect this non-trivial um, amount of phase, uh, Essentially, the statement is that you will prove that uh, there are quantum uh, degrees of freedom for, for gravity, right? That is that is what. Uh, now, if you uh, fail to detect the, the non-trivial phase, if it turns out that there is no signal, uh, that should not mean that the gravity is classical, right? So, so you cannot conclude that gravity because the, the degrees of freedom of Quant the quantum degrees of freedom of gravity may not be the ones that are part participating in this process, right? Yeah, yeah. so you're absolutely correct. So this experiment goes one way, okay? So if you detect uh, entanglement, okay? I should probably, so so when I, I loosely say sometimes detection of phase, but it's not really detection of phase. The phase is what gives the entanglement because of course phase you can have also from a classical art giving phase to a you know superposition which is a very long ago experiment you know colello overhauser warner experiment very celebrated experiment so here that is not the case here it is the entanglement so you have to measure the entanglement but but yeah if you get no entanglement still it might have decohered due to other means yeah is is quite possible okay, okay thank you okay great um, then we can keep all other burning questions for the discussion and um, proceed with Marcos' talk. Thanks a lot, Marcos, for being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, can, okay, so how is the echo doing? Is it still okay? It's okay, yeah, it's okay. Okay, very good. Um, before I start, I have one immediate comment to Marco that we can then uh, um, maybe uh, pick up in the discussion if, if wanted or needed. Um, so none of these experiments will make, or do make, and I, I will make this point uh, later on also, any comments or any um, statements about the field degrees of freedom. Okay, so uh, we cannot with these experiments say anything about quantization of the field degrees of freedom. We talk about the quantum nature, I will, we will discuss this surely, but the um, degrees of freedom of the field, they are untouched by these type of experiments. And let me, I come, I come back to that, but I just wanted to make that ad hoc um, comment um, to this statement. Okay, so um, I promised to stick more to the experimental side. And um, let me start uh, briefly by telling you what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, Aaron in his introduction uh, nicely said, uh, the interesting challenges at the moment is um, what type of experiments exist there to test the quantum nature of 
gravity. And um, in essence, this boils down to two possible approaches. The one approach is you assume that there exists a quantum theory of gravity. You do have a very specific uh, theory in mind, or at least you have some set of assumptions that underlie a specific uh, theory in mind. And you probe the consequences in the low energy regime in tabletop experiments. Um, note that these type of tests do not necessarily require gravity measurements. Right? Um, Sugato already mentioned some examples. Um, uh, basically, there can be influences on the dynamics of a system, and it's sufficient to simply just measure uh, dynamics in a certain in a certain parameter issue. And I give you here just for your uh, own uh, study a couple of references that you can um, look up. I want to focus on the second possibility. The second possibility is the more puristic approach. You try to assume as little as possible about the interplay between quantum physics and gravity. And you simply probe experimentally the consequences of quantum configurations of gravitational source masses. And this obviously requires gravity measurements because now essentially what you want to do is you want to probe um, the phenomenology of the gravitational field created by a gravitational source mass in quantum states of motion. And so I'm focusing on this one. Now, um, the first question that comes to mind, and this is where we have an answer to already because the experiment since now more than 60 years, 50 years, is uh, how do quantum systems react to gravity? This we know. Um, I just give you here two um, nice examples that you probably have already seen. Um, the one that uh, Zugato already mentioned is the famous experiment by Colela, Overhauser, and Werner, also called the Cow experiment after the initials of the authors, where they simply probe the impact of um, Earth's gravitational field, so a classical background field, on the wave packet of a neutron. Uh, in essence, the neutron collects a dynamical phase while it traverses through the gravitational field. And what they do in the experiment is they pick up a phase difference when a neutron is in a superposition where the two branches are at different heights of the, um, of, of, of the Earth. And then by rotating it, changing the, um, the phase difference and thereby seeing an interference pattern that is generated by the gravitational coupling to the neutron's wave packet. Another beautiful example is from the Wineland group where there you see here in an optical table um, uh, where you have an optical clock and they simply measure the frequency of this optical clock and then they lift the optical table by 30 centimeters and they measure how the frequency also um, shifts due to gravitational time dilation in the gravitational field of the earth and if you check the archive every now and then there was a couple of weeks ago a beautiful experiment by Yi's group from Chilla, where they measured effects of gravitational time dilation in an optical clock ensemble at a height difference of one millimeter so the precision right now of optical clocks is already to the extent that we can measure time dilation effects in earth's gravitational field um, on the size of 10 to the minus three meter but all of these so these are absolutely beautiful experiments. And I'm pretty sure you also know the follow-up experiments. The cow experiment is in, in, it's tremendously great. Atomic fountain experiment, um, gravimeters uh, based on atom interferometry and so on. And all of these experiments, however, um, and this is not meant as a negative connotation, this is simply a stating effect, are very well described and understood within standard quantum theory. So at the end of the day, you basically write down quantum field theory in curved space time if you really want to push it, okay? Um, so um, what Zugato was talking about is now the reverse question. So instead of asking how do quantum systems react to gravity, we ask now how does gravity react to a quantum system? Okay? And this is, the, this is actually our next question. So Gato also already mentioned, so basically I will say that now in front of, before every slide, because we agreed that I simply just follow up on this talk, um, that uh, the discussions on this topic can be traced back at least um, to the days of the Chapel Hill conference in 57, um, where uh, at this conference, two uh, questions of experimental nature, possible experimental nature were discussed. The first one was, do um, gravitational waves exist? And uh, the second one was, does gravity require quantum description? 
So it took now approximately 60 years to answer the first question. And uh, now that we have ticked off the first one of the conference, we can now start working on the second one. <laughs> and I, I, I guess basically the point that I want to make now in the following is that there is hope. Okay, I think the hope is similar to um, the level of hope that there was uh, uh, maybe 50 years ago about gravitational waves. So it's still very far in the future experimentally, but right now it looks like um, it's more technical problems than fundamental. So um, here is the uh, argument in a nutshell. And again, I'm just very briefly repeating what you have learned in the first talk. Uh, imagine that you have um, some sort of device where you have a mass, the mass carries a spin, okay? And the spin now traverses through a Stein-Gerlach device, which allows you then to prepare the mass essentially in a superposition of being up, um, of being up and being down. Okay. And what you then do is you have created now the mass in the superposition of these two possible positions, and uh, then you couple it to a second mass. Yeah, so you have here mass one, you have mass two, and now you switch on the gravitational coupling between these two masses. And just through gravitational interaction, this initial uh, separable state between these two masses will generate entanglement, an entangled state. And there's a certain rate um, that, uh, at which this will happen. So um, gravity can entangle. From a, from a quantum point of view, you, this is a totally trivial, a totally trivial statement, and we all believe that right? that we will generate entanglement when we uh, couple two objects where one is in a superposition. However, from a GR point of view, this is totally non-obvious because, from a GR perspective, um, the gravitational force is um, can be can be mapped onto a situation where a test mass moves in the G, uh, moves in free fall along a geodesic that is generated by the source mass. Okay, so um, the geodesic in a metric that is generated by the source mass. So according to quantum, uh, according to, to regular GR, um, uh, any mass configuration uh, produces a fixed space-time metric. So if I now have a test mass that um, is in initially separable from my source mass, and the test mass just follows along a geodesic in a fixed space-time metric, it will never generate entanglement. It will always stay separated. So the only way I can actually generate entanglement through geodesic motion is if the geodesic motion of the test mass also occurs in a superposed um, metric, okay? So that means whenever you uh, generate uh, entanglement, um, then basically there's no way that you can trace this uh, generation of entanglement back to motion of fixed space time metric. So observation of entanglement is inconsistent with the assumption that the space time metric generated by the source mass is fixed. Okay. And that is the that is the from a puristic point of view, and this um, from the experimental side, you should always be as puristic as possible. This is the statement you can make. Okay, so the, the experimental outcome, if you observe entanglement, um, the experimental outcome is inconsistent with the assumption that you have a fixed space, uh, fixed space time metric. It has to have been in a superposition. Um, there are two ways now of uh, performing such an experiment. The one is the one that Sugato already mentioned and that has been proposed in these papers, which is you start off with your two systems, your two masses, each in a superposition with a, um, uh, with a separation of the center of masses um, on the order of delta x and the distance d. And uh, now you have exactly uh, the, um, uh, this, um, uh, this mass here evolves, uh, the, the wave packet here on this side evolves um, uh, in the potential. I think we have lost our speaker. Uh, let's hope that Marcus will be able to continue in a second. Okay, uh, so maybe he will rejoin now. Otherwise, 
we can maybe for the time being continue with um, questions for Sugato. So if there are more, more urgent questions, then feel free to ask them. Uh, I have a question. Uh, this is George Minnick from Virginia Tech. Um, Sugato, uh, I have a question about a possibility of checking for triple interference. Um, you know, Sorkin has this very nice uh, suggestion. And recently we wrote a paper how you could maybe che uh, check this with neutrinos because, you know, you have three states and um, you could in principle try to check intrinsic triple interference, which is not allowed in quantum mechanics, right? Uh, by Born rule, it's always pairwise. So uh, in your experiments, when you're testing this, you always have a pairwise interaction. What about if in that type of um, argument, you introduce a third mass? Uh, Would it so, be possible to, to check for the Born rule and the triple interference? Yeah, so, so there are two kinds of things you can think of here. Uh, a, a third mass is something also we will uh, add something uh, in, in a recent paper that uh, we are coming up with, okay? But the other thing which is more, uh, would be the more natural thing uh, answer to your question would be that you have uh, three like three slits you have three components in the superposition exactly that's that's what happens with neutrinos because you have three states and they could all mix and you could in principle check mm -hmm. especially on this Juno experiment that is uh, coming up right now of mm -hmm. course there are backgrounds that you should worry about you know uh, to extract this but anyway I'm just wondering okay so you have thought about this yeah, so we have a paper on QDITs, but I will. I think Marcus is back, so maybe we can okay. come back to this. Uh, in a, so I'll, I'll, All right. I'll tell something. Yes, Marcus, can you hear us? I saw him become co-host again. So I. Yeah, yeah. So he is back in the call, but. Yeah, I'm back in the call, but I, I apologize dearly. Um, can you see me, hear me? We can see you again, yes. Okay, the question is now how I actually share my screen because I had to, um, I had to leave this, uh, wait a second, I do it like that. So, careful. So we need to do it like that now. So we Sorry. lost you when you were starting to talk about the second um, experiment. Yeah, possibly. exactly. Okay, thanks. So do you have me? Yes, we do. Okay, good. So um, just to summarize, so in this experiment, um, this is the one that Sugato described. You start out with a superposition of these two masses and you now generate um, here uh, again a, a dynamical phase in the potential of the other one, like in the cow experiment. This overall this acts like a, um, a conditional phase case from quantum information and you generate entanglement. Um, the other way of doing it is um, you simply have two harmonic oscillators. So you have two masses confined to harmonic potentials with a wave packet of delocalization delta x and uh, separated by a distance d and those two couple gravitationally. If initially the two are in a product state, then also just the one over our potential to so the gravitational interaction will entangle uh, those two. Now, um, if you uh, estimate the entanglement rate, so the rate at which the generation of entanglement happens, then it turns out that in both cases, uh, this boils down to the following expression. Um, this entanglement rate is essentially the ratio of the two natural constants. Then it's the mass times the delocalization squared divided by the distance cubed. And you see it's the mass and delocalization that enters and delocalization is now depending on the scheme that you use. It's either the initial separ uh, initial um, uh, superposition, size of the superposition, or it is the initial size of the wave packet. And uh, you can also from here already see the relevant parameter that you're interested in from an experiment point of view is that you take the mass times the delocalization times the square root of the coherence time as large as possible or m squared delta x squared times the uh, um, coherence time. Um, 
Now, uh, let's, let's have a look um, what this implies. So first of all, uh, a rather trivial consequence is uh, the following. So uh, the entanglement rate is, um, is uh, of, of this expression here. And now let's, let's just take some typical numbers very similar to the one that, um, and so that Sugato already uh, took. Let's say um, we can have a distance between the two systems on the order of a micrometer. Okay, and let's assume um, that you can have a delocalization that is almost on the order of the separation. So that's already quite large, so a large separation. Um, so if you have that, you see that then your coupling, if you estimate that here, um, it turns out to be something on the order of six, six times 10 to the 27 mass square. And um, this should be, um, let's say, what is the, let's say, what, what is the best we can hope for in terms of coherence rates? Okay, so I, I would say the best that we can hope for is on the order of a second of coherence rate, okay? Um, so uh, in order to have this entanglement rate on the order of this coherence rate, uh, you see that the mass needs to be larger than um, uh, on the order of um, 10 to the minus uh, um, 14 kilogram, which means this mass needs to be confined in a volume of d cubed, so distance cubed, uh, that the density um, that you require in order to achieve, uh, let's say, competitive entanglement rates uh, has to have at least solid state densities. So uh, this is something that just confirms what Sugato also already mentioned to you, that um, it's highly unlikely that uh, the generation of entanglement via gravitational interaction will be possible with anything else than a dense solid state objects. Second thing is, um, also here, I'm basically uh, just giving you a couple of more references to what Sugato already alluded to. Um, of course, we need to avoid the appearance of a classical world in these experiments, essentially by knocking out uh, the decoherence phenomena or by essentially coupling larger, have coherent coupling on a time scale that is larger than the decoherence happens. Now, what are typical decoherence phenomena that are relevant? Well, um, you can have gas collisions, you can have black body radiation. And um, if you put the numbers, you see that typical gas collisions of a cold gas um, uh, will really be so strong that a single gas scattering event already delocalizes or localizes your particle, um, which is a so-called short wavelength regime of the um, of decoherence, where uh, which then leads to typical gas decoherence rates that just scale with the scattering cross section um, of your particle. Black body radiation is a little bit different because the wavelength of the emitted radiation or the absorbed um, uh, radiation or scattered radiation is longer um, than the delocalization of your particle typically, which means that the decoherence rate scales um, uh, with, the, uh, with your delocalization until you then reach um, the regime where you enter the short wavelength regime again. And um, again, this is all well uh, studied. All the coherence models are here in this um, in the in these papers uh, and uh, you basically using um, uh, all of these um, uh, all of these assumptions you can um, you can see that uh, you, you, you can you can basically write down the conditions or the decoherence rates for gas damping which depends on the, the pressure that you have the particle size the environment temperature uh, you have black body scattering absorption and emission that will give you conditions um, for the environment temperature and the internal temperature of the particle. Uh, then a couple of things that Zugato also mentioned, you can have fluctuations in your system. So when you have trapped particles, for example, when the trap fluctuates, this creates heating. Um, when frequency fluctuates, this creates heating. And uh, obviously, if for the case of the harmonic oscillators, they can actually couple to the environment through uh, simply thermal decoherence with a certain dissipation rate, then you also have a certain decoherence rate just given by the quality um, or by the, by the uh, isolation of your system. So these are all things you need to take into account and we will see in the end what that means. So let me uh, now quickly come to the experimental questions, which are at the end of the day, the following two. We need for such experiments, isolate gravity as a coupling force. So that means how small can we make a source mass and actually measure its gravitational field? This is question number one. And the second one is obviously the other way around. Uh, how massive can we make a quantum system and then uh, still measure and, and, and maintain coherence? 
Yeah? So the one is a um, top-down approach, the other one is a bottom-up approach. Let's see what um, is the current state of art. What I plotted here is coherence time and mass. So let's quickly look at the quantum system. So you see that um, small mass systems like uh, atoms and molecules, they have extremely large coherence times. However, the mass is way too small to create, um, uh, let's say, a gravitational coupling on a sufficiently short time scale. So you need larger masses. And so you go to solid state systems. However, you see that the coherence time also goes down. Now, uh, on the gravity side, the smallest mass for which a gravitational field has been, had been measured some time ago was in the order of a gram. And um, you, you see, this is a log scale, right? So the challenge really is you need to push this domain here to the right, the quantum domain, and you also need to push the gravity domain here to the left. So um, let's quickly start with the gravity case. And you, you really need to experimentally learn where are the challenges um, in order to, let's say, to make optimistic or pessimistic statements then about where you actually want to go, which is, which is this domain here, right here in the middle, uh, ideally up there somewhere. Okay, so what did we do? Well, first of all, we wanted to see, um, can we measure the gravitational field of a smaller objects than has been measured before? And what we chose just for some practical reasons, the first estimates that we had uh, was simply a gold mass. You can see here, this is a, a one millimeter radius gold mass um, that we used in a Cavendish style experiment. So the idea is very simple. You have here your source mass and you basically periodically modulate your source mass by a certain amplitude in our experiment. The amplitude was um, a few millimeter uh, that we modulated the mass. Obviously, what you create here at the position of the test mass um, is a time varying gravitational um, force uh, that leads then to a time dependent acceleration that we want to measure. So basically, um, for the source mass of uh, 90 um, uh, milligram that we, that we had here in our experiment, uh, uh, um, the um, uh, 90 microgram that we had here, in, uh, milligram that we had in the experiment, um, we get accelerations on the order of 10 to the minus 10 meter per second square. So 10 to the minus 11. This is something that we need to measure. And uh, you already saw the, um, the theory plots uh, from, from Zugato, the estimates and also the measurements that LIGO made. Obviously, such small accelerations do pose an, a real challenge for experiments because um, you can see that here, um, because um, this, these are type of accelerations that the environment creates for you. So what you see here is a typical response of our system at different frequencies um, as a function of time. And you can see, for example, so yellow means there's a lot of, um, lot of amplitude and blue means there's nothing. And what, you, what is plotted here is simply the response of our test mass pendulum. So the test mass um, uh, displacement that we, that we, that we measure and as a function of uh, frequency and time. And this 10 millihertz line here, this large amplitude, um, this coincides with the traffic light cycle at a road crossing that is 60 meters away from our lab. So this is basically acceleration of cars, uh, trains, um, people, uh, pedestrians walking and so on. And you see that there's always a time of the day where there's nothing that's dark. And where there's nothing uh, is essentially when the trams are not going and the cars are not going. So this is between midnight and 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, and you see, then you have these uh, one, two, three, four, five, um, six, seven. Right? And um, it's always from, from the seven, there's always uh, two dark streaks that are not so dark. And this is actually Friday and Saturday night where people are out in the street partying. Um, so this leaves us with um, five days of good measurement, or five nights of good measurements where such an experiment can run. Well, and by the way, um, we also have, uh, this is our lab and the purple thing here are, are tram stations. Uh, and a typical tram, Vienna tram weighs 90 tons. And it turns out that the gravitational force produced by a 90 ton Vienna tram that is like 70 meters away from our lab is on the same order of magnitudes than the gravitational force that is generated by our source mass. So luckily, uh, we are only sensitive to field gradients. And um, so the torsional pendulum doesn't pick up that noise, but this is a fundamental issue in such experiments. 
So um, at the end of the day, I just give you here the, the result. Uh, what we observe now, and you see here the, um, the, the red one is the actually measured um, force signal. And you see that at the modulation frequency of our source mask, we see um, a nice signal that corresponds to the one, uh, to the gravitational signal that we expect um, through um, uh, just Newtonian coupling. Because of the one over R potential, so it's a modulation in a nonlinear potential, you also get higher orders in the response. And we also see the, um, the first of the higher orders um, that is produced from the gravitation driving of a 90 milligram source mass. So uh, just say again, the, the acceleration modulation that we resolve is on the order of 10 to the minus 10 meter per second square. And we do that with a precision of 1%. So our actual acceleration sensitivity is 10 to the minus 13 G that we reach in this experiment. And um, there are some systematic deviations. Uh, so it's not only Newtonian, um, but we can uh, basically nail down 90% of the effects to Newtonian coupling and uh, on the order of 10% to other effects. That um, uh, um, is actually also quite interesting to see um, what other effects play a role in such experiment um, from the fact that um, the sphere does have a hole, the fact that other um, parts of the experiment also exhibit a gravitational field, you have magnetic electrostatic effects, the roundness such that uh, basically you do not really know uh, accurately where the center of mass is and so on and so on. Now, um, the next step where we want to go is... Actually, Markus, are you yes. able to maybe finish in like five minutes or so? Yes, no problem. Thanks. Next great. step where we want to go is um, that uh, you, you see we want to go to smaller source masses um, uh, like uh, this size and uh, the current experiment that we try to build is to measure the gravitational acceleration generated by uh, a Planck mass object, which is 25 micrograms. And in order to do that, we need to um, get rid of all the noise that I showed you. And the way we do that is we go underground. Um, we are right now setting up this experiment in a mine. This is our spot where the experiment is currently being built and uh, the noise uh, actually looks extremely promising. Okay, um, let me uh, briefly also mention the quantum part. Um, where are we here? So for the quantum part, um, the current experiments are of two types. So either you have meta wave interference experiments with, as I said, relatively small masses, but very large uh, superposition sizes and large coherence times, or you have solid state oscillators um, with 10 orders of magnitude larger mass, but with 10 orders of magnitude less uh, delocalization of the superposition that is created. So this product delta XM that is relevant is the same in both of these experiments. It's just here that the coherence time outweighs this one. So what you really want is you want to have a combination of these two approaches where you have the long coherence times of the free fall and the, um, the, the solid state densities of the mechanics. And uh, this is why we now levitate our uh, solid state objects. So um, what we do is we have uh, right now glass nanoparticles that we trap in an optical tweezer. And um, there the main idea is that the intensity profile of a focused laser beam is nothing else than the, than the inverted potential landscape that the particle sees, which means in such a Gaussian uh, profile um, for small displacements, you actually have a 3D confinement in a quasi harmonic trap for the particle. So you can trap the particle. The next thing that you can do is um, you can read out the position of the particle. So um, uh, you have light tweezer that, uh, that, that traps the particle, scatters light, and you can use the forward scattered light to get position information. And you can also use the, um, you can also use the backward scattered light to get position information. And um, in the backward scattered light, uh, this carries most information about the position. And what we can do now uh, is we can um, uh, use a um, certain imaging technique to have a quantum limited position measurement of the particle trajectory at the Heisenberg limit. So that means we have a particle sitting here in ultra high vacuum at room temperature, and we monitor its dynamics um, uh, with a a precision that is close to its quantum ground state of motion. So we can reconstruct um, the quantum trajectory of the particle. And if we want, we can now use this information and apply a real-time feedback to stabilize the particle motion in its quantum ground state of motion. And this is what we are doing. So we have prepared um, a 
150 nanometer glass sphere in a quantum ground state of motion sitting in a room temperature environment. And this is an actual image of the particle being in the quantum ground state of motion um, in a room temperature environment. And the occupation here in these experiments is on the order of 0.5. Okay? Now, um, there are other ways of doing that. We have recently demonstrated that you can also use a laser cooling technique from the known from atomic physics, which is called coherent scattering into an optical cavity. Um, the details are not so relevant right now. Uh, just suffice to say, what you do is you resonantly enhance the anti-Stokes scattered um, contribution of the inelastic Raman scattering process, which is the one where the photon takes energy away from the particle, um, uh, thereby uh, leaving the uh, center of mass motion with less energy and eventually cooling it to the quantum ground state of motion. And we achieved similar occupations um, also in the ground state. So we have different ways um, of, um, of preparing the particle in its quantum ground state of motion. Right? So it means we can prepare now pure state wave packets. And for the, for the, for the uh, uh, parameters that we have right now, this is on the order of three picometers, the ground state size. Okay, the question is, how can you now get large um, uh, wave packets or how can you generate large superpositions? Okay, large wave packets, for example, you could do via free fall. You can switch off the trap and then already after some tens of milliseconds, the wave packet just via dispersion would achieve sizes on the order of the particle size. Okay? And this you could do. Um, however, now comes um, all, the, uh, all the decoherence story that I told you. And um, I don't go into the details. You can believe me that we have measured all the decoherence, uh, uh, relevant decoherence processes in this experiment. And we come to the conclusion that in order to get really a wave packet size larger than the particle size in an experiment like we have right now, we would require pressures on the order of 10 to the minus 11 millibar and environment temperatures on the order of 130 Kelvin in order to prevent uh, gas collisions and black body radiation um, uh, to uh, decohere the particle. And now the big challenge is, of course, what Sugato then was saying, how do we go from here? This is, this is what we have right now, okay? We do have now ground state particles. How do we get to here or alternatively to the situation where delta X is basically a large uh, coherent expanded state, like a Swiss state, okay? There are different uh, proposals out there in the literature. Um, there's a beautiful one along the lines that Sugata was uh, saying from Ron Folman, and there are other possibilities by uh, diffraction, by uh, free fall and quantum, uh, and quantum measurement and so on. So I come to an end. Um, I just mentioned very briefly, we are also doing um, levitation now with larger particles. So we do have Planck mass uh, type um, objects um, that we levitate in a cryogenic environment um, magnetically. They are superconducting particles, and we already see uh, relatively nice, um, promising data on the dephasing time, so the T2 star time, um, that tells us that this should be a good, a well isolated system for such experiments. Okay, um, this is my final statement here, my final, uh, my final point I want to make. Um, if you take the numbers that I showed in the beginning, uh, the decoherence rates, then you have the following challenge. For such a glass sphere that we have, you would require now a delocalization of larger than two micrometer in order to um, uh, uh, overcome the decoherence um, uh, challenges that I wrote down before. So we assume now um, that we can uh, achieve this purity of the, of, the, of the state and that we can have this uh, uh, pressure situation. And even if we have that, we still need delocalizations larger than two microns and temperatures on the order of a few Kelvin. And you can also now do the same for the, for the Planck mass uh, uh, LED sphere or even for the LIGO uh, interferometer. And you see that in all of the cases, the amount of delocalization that you need is many, many orders of magnitude larger than the original ground state wave packet size. And this is the actual challenge at the moment um, that we have not yet solved. We hope, of course, that this is only a technical hurdle. Um, and there are several ideas how to get there. But right now, experimentally, there's nothing, okay? So basically, we do not have anything here. We have uh, the only squeezing data that we have is 0.8 dB. And um, uh, well, there, there are many, many orders of magnitudes missing um, to go beyond that at the current, uh, the current state.
But I think the challenges are very well defined and we just need to work very hard um, to, um, to overcome them. And I sincerely hope uh, that they will be of technical nature. So here's my summary. And um, I think it contains already everything that I said. So I leave it with that and um, stop. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcus. And I'll also thank you for all of us. And again, I invite the audience um, to pose questions to Marcus um, or already proceed to a more open discussion. So if there's no um, question at the moment, let me maybe, you had this nice plot where there's this um, large gap between sort of the quantum world and the gravitational world. And you also had the formula that you showed that es essentially explains that. And you said that it's the same in the setup that um, Sugato explained and the one that you added to that. So would you say that this is a, the, that this formula and this gap is fundamental in the sense that you could come up with any type of new experiment, but you would always need to overcome this gap. Is that correct? Um, no, I, I think everything I said um, refers to the, um, the specific scheme of trying to generate entanglement via gravity. I would be very much interested <laughs> and, and this is one of the challenges i also pose at the at, at my at my summary slide i would be very much interested to discuss um other approaches where you probe the phenomenology of um uh, of, a, of quantum source masses without looking at the entanglement so are there less demanding ways of learning something interesting about the um, quantum nature of gravity or about the, um, the, the, the interaction of the, um, uh, how, how, how does Penrose call it, the gravitization of quantum mechanics. So, to, um, yeah, so this is the question, okay? Everything I said refers to entanglement generation via gravity. And there the statement is, given all the numbers that we have, given all the decoherence analysis that we have, this is a super demanding experiment. We are uh, light years away um, from realizing anything like that, but we know how to get there, which is actually already quite a statement, okay? Um, I think this is very similar to example, uh, uh, to for example, uh, other big dreams uh, back when, when, when things like, like LIGO started, right? So it was sort of, um, there was a, it was clear that which sort of technological hurdles have to be overcome, um, but uh, at least there's no, um, there's no lack of uh, of ideas at the moment. Yes, yes, thanks. Um, then, uh, George, you, you have your hand up again. So. Yes, uh, Marcus, you just mentioned the magic words for me. I mean, by the way, a wonderful talk, uh, both Sugato thanks. and Marcus. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. But uh, the, ma the magic word is gravitization, the quantum. Um, uh, and I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, some other people know history better. That was also raised at that uh, famous Chapel Hill uh, conference, right? Um, in that discussion, whether to quantize, how to quantize, is it semi class or whatever, what, what's going on with, uh, with the quantization of gravity. And uh, there's this idea, right? Uh, um, that, uh, as you know, uh, many people, uh, including myself and collaborators, Pendrose, of course, famous for it. I think Steve has been talking about this as well. It's, it's to gravitize the quantum, even though, you know, you have to kind of propose the context. How would one, um, I, I was asking Sugata this question about triple interference. Obviously, if there was a triple interference, uh, you would be sort of transcending the Born rule. And the best, uh, as far as I understand, uh, bounds on that at the moment, are of course, photonic, electromagnetic. We have recently proposed neutronic probes because neutrons don't have boundaries like electromagnetic, uh, you know, like photons might have and scattering and so forth. And there are three of them. Anyway, there are other backgrounds there. But it's interesting to ask this question. Uh, how does one uh, uh, probe that boundary, right, uh, between quantization of gravity, in other words, using the rules of quantum theory, um, mm. and, and, and then distinguish it from classical gravity, and the mm. other one, 
which I think it's much more exciting, <laughs> if could one make it precise and definitely <laughs> empirical, uh, gravitizing the quantum. In other words, uh, that somehow gravity does to quantum theory exactly what classical gravity does to electromagnetism, everything else. In other words, mm -hmm. gravitizes it, right? So, so whatever that means, of course. And and so, so what what are what are your thoughts about this? I mean, people talk about gravitational decoherence, and that's very hard because you're competing with this decoherent stuff. People trying to do those experiments, like Bowmister and others, various people you probably mm -hmm. know better, but. Uh, what are your thoughts about this gravitization of the quantum? How would one distinguish from quantizing gravity? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I, I think my answer will be rather lame because I think um, from an experimental uh, point of view, uh, what we are trying to do right now is uh, push the um, quantum phenomena to the larger and larger masses. And uh, until eventually we, we include gravitational phenomena, so uh, in a way, um, we are we are trying to um, to see the expected. Yeah? So uh, in a way, it would be hard to imagine that um, for any quantum theory of gravity, that it would not. So it, let's say if now, okay, let's say if gravity requires a quantum description, then I think it's almost natural to assume that in the in the low energy limit. Um, so where our experiments take place, you will always be able to write down an effective quantum field theory, and this we can do. So we know from a from a quantum perspective for the for the for the for the gravitational phenomena, we know exactly what to expect. Uh, it has to be if if there's a quantum uh, description of gravity, uh, it has to follow in a way um, the standard quantum field theory approaches. I mean, this is now maybe even a bold statement, but um, and so you see deviations from there. I think, okay, this is where I would look for. So wherever it deviates from an effective quantum field theory in the low energy regime uh, is awkward. It's something that is somehow completely, this would be already completely unexpected. I mean, the, the most unexpected one would be don't see any quantum effects at all, okay? But, but even seeing deviations from, a, um, from an effective quantum field theoretic description would, in my eyes, be equally awkward. I, I, I agree with you, but uh, I don't think that's awkward. You know, I mean, one thing that we learn in quantum <laughs> theory right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that you see in quantum theory, right, historically, we didn't discover things immediately looking at microscopics. I mean, of course, there was spectroscopy and so forth. We looked at actually macroscopic phenomena, but statistical, black body radiation, specific heats, et cetera, right? And, and so the question is, what are the analog statistical and perhaps infrared effects right? That could mm -hmm. then have dramatic uh, contributions to what you're saying. Because you see, when we say effective field theory, we assume a lot of things. We assume classical space-time. We assume that, um, uh, you know, locality in a kind of classical sense, right? We assume uh, everything, consequences of that, like, I don't know, spin statistics, things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, that's a load, right? Where quantum gravity could uh, be as uh, radical as quantum theory was for classical physics and therefore actually change our prejudices about effective field theory. Look, we also assume decoupling, right? So that means that the IR and UV, you know, yes, don't yes. talk to each other. Mm -hmm. But if yes. you look at, I don't know, dark energy or something, cosmological constant, well, on one side, it's quantum, it's vacuum energy. On the other side, it's something, a parameter in Einstein's equation that we measure. So obviously mm. some type of UVIR. It's not precise. I'm not saying mm. that we understand this precisely, but obviously once you turn on gravity, something happens there that could be as strange as once we try to precisely understand atomistic. And we found out that, well, you know, burning piece of coal, right, uh, departs from uh, Boltzmann Gibbs statistics. And that explains <laughs> specific heats. And you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, mm. so, so, have you thought about this kind of statistical effects or uh, uh, of quantum gravity? No, not yet. Uh, I mean, we, we have looked at some, at some time ago into um, uh, just uh, dynamical consequences of quantum theories of gravity, um, but uh, not, not into the type that you are saying. And I, I agree, this is worthwhile doing, definitely. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Christian, if you want to continue with questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I'm wondering now if we're talking about the decoherence and how to overcome it. You're always moving now, uh, more people are moving to these um, magnetic levitation towards the optical levitation. The exchange particle for the magnetics is still a photon, as far as I know. So I wonder if we have to cancel gravity or, or be stronger than the gravitational force in both cases. Why are there less photons or why is there less decoherence in the magnetic levitation? That doesn't really make sense to me, but there should be a point to this. Could you, do you know this? Could you help me out? Um, so um, first of all, uh, so there are two things. No? So the, uh, let's say the, the effective dipole moment that couples to the, to the field that keeps the particle is much stronger in, this, in, the, in the magnetic case, in the supernatural case. And so second, the wavelength of the photons no, that are being used um, is dramatically different. No? So, um, the, no? so the, the effective scattering, the, the photon recoil, no, if you want, that you have in the optical trap is just a limiting factor. This is not the case here. Okay, thank you. Mm. Um, then Ted Jacobson, you had your hand up, but now it's um, lowered again. I'm not sure whether you, you still have a question. If that's not the case, um, maybe I can, I can jump in with one because I still had an experimental question. So it's probably um, for Marcos. And that's, um, so, you have to make sure that it's not um, an entanglement that's sourced by electromagnetism or yes, by something exactly. else. And yes. you probably come up, or uh, that's what I got from your talk, that you uh, provide a lot of reasoning that there shouldn't be this um, other channel of um, entanglement. But is there a fundamental sort of way in which you could tell the two apart, or is it just that, no, so, you, so essentially, we just have to believe that reasoning is that yeah no, no well you know um so what you do in experiments um you systematically uh, check for effects yeah, um, for, by scaling for example yeah? so um if you want to uh, um if you want to um uh, exclude um significant contribution of cooler you try to do your best to discharge your particles okay but then it's large particles, okay? So you can still have, uh, through defects in the material, you can still have a finite uh, dipole moment that is left, that is simply in the material. There is no chance that you can eliminate that. Um, so you still have them when you start, uh, you still then have dipole-dipole coupling between the two, uh, just due to uh, inhomogeneities um, uh, in the material. And all of these you need to quantify um, before you do such experiments. So like I, I, um, I deliberately showed you this very extensive table that we did when we checked for systematic, systematic effects in our gravity experiment. So um, that shows you that it's possible to quantify different contributions. Yeah? Um, so for example, through scaling, through deliberately charging, discharging, and with scaling, I mean changing distances and looking at the effects and so on. Okay, so this is the way how you then um, uh, well learn about uh, what is the origin of your of your company. So you you need to minimize the amount of assumptions as much as possible. So you rather be sure that it's gravity, and this can be done experimentally. Yes, thanks. Um, then I see that Marco has a hand up. I, I want to before that ask Ted whether whether you still have a question. Well, I did. I decided it might be too flaky to ask, but since you're prodding me, I'll go ahead. <laughs> it was, um, so in the challenge of preparing a coherent, you know, wide wave packet, mm. I just wondered, is there any hope of doing that by sort of the Zeno effect? So in other words, set up a way of looking at it and forcing it to collapse into continuously into the state you want it to be with a growing, like, Make an observable that say that observes this the fact that it's in a wide Gaussian, and then continuously widen the Gaussian observable mm. that you're making. Um, so, in, in principle, Ted, yes, uh, you, you, you uh, remember I showed um, in my in my slides that what we're doing at the moment um, we can um, continuously measure the um, quantum trajectory of the particles, so meaning monitoring the motion um, at the Heisenberg limit. 
And um, in, instead of stabilizing that now to the quantum ground state, you could also stabilize that to some other uh, squeeze state, for example. And in right. fact, that is something that is something we're currently working on. So we want to see whether this um, whether these control theoretical methods that people have developed uh, can be used to generate now squeeze state by by continuous feedback and and control. Yes. So it wasn't that flaky. Thank you. No, <laughs> no. I, I I'm, I'm still I'm still doubtful whether we get this full 60 dB. OK, but that's another topic that <laughs> we, we talk about that in five years again. And then Marco, if you if you want to. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank both speakers for uh, for a beautiful lectures. I mean, this is uh, hearing Marcus and Sugat to talk is always nice. So uh, I want to ask a question, uh, uh, more of a conceptual kind of a thing, to to both of you, if 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 uh, if that's okay. Um, so when you when you uh, when you ask a, a a guy who is trained in general relativity what is gravity, he's going to say curvature. Okay, so that's tidal forces, if you will. Okay, so 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 that's the only thing that that uh, uh, general relativity is, is about in this sense. So um, is there a, a way uh, or maybe has has this been done in, in terms of your your experiments and your, the analysis that you do uh, when when you discuss uh, gravitational effects and com com uh, combining them with quantum theory? Um, is there, a, uh, did you actually try or did anyone try? Do you know a reference that, that anybody tried to re, re express all that in terms of curvature? So, are you measuring tidal forces of anything in your experiments or not? And, and how does that, uh, are there any, any at least conceptual um, results that describe this in an invariant manner? I'm asking this because. Uh, there is this huge thing about uh, uh, diffeomorphism invariance and gauge invariance of gravity that is that is very very tricky thing to do and uh, when you when you discuss anything any kind of result any kind of experiment on uh, measurement you have to be very careful that you are not measuring something that is gauge dependent in a, in a sense so, so curvature mm -hmm. is not gauge dependent so, so if you express everything in terms of curvature then there is no you're safe uh, that you have that you're talking about the physical effect but has this been done do you have any any maybe a reference or anything any kind of comment about about um, expressing the, the 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 analysis in terms of tidal forces so i can give you an um, for, um uh, i can give you an experimental reference um there has been a, a pil in 2017 from the kasevich group the first author is Asenbaum, and uh, what they are doing is they um, uh, have a uh, interferometer where the uh, wave packet is so large um, that in the interference, um, so that the inter that the well, it's it's a double interferometer, and the, let me say the interference effect is due to the curvature over the spread of the interferometer. Okay, that's, that's so this could be this could be a helpful reference um, uh, in this direction. Thank you. That's that's great. That's great. Yeah. So so maybe I can add uh, something to that. So essentially, the 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 entanglement is due to the curvature. You see, because you are getting the difference from the one by r. You see, that, that so, is what uh, I expect. Yes, that is yeah. what I expect. So but it is exactly you know, due to the is, tidal is there force. A formula? Is there an equation? The, yeah, and then maybe it is better described uh, more more closer in in Marcus's slide where he puts this uh, delta x square by d cube. Yeah, that is the curvature. So 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 that is really that is really r zero one zero one. Yeah. Okay. So so okay. so that is how they they entangle due to their curvatures pr produced by each other, right? For for each component of separation. And if you talk about uh, treatments, so there, uh, so so I can allude to two treatments. So one of them was made by uh, you know Carlo Rovelli and uh, Marios Cristodolo, uh, as so the, you can view this effect as a superposition of time dilations, right? So you can do a full GR treatment using a superposition of curvatures. And then uh, our, our paper with uh, Ryan Marshman, we do uh, more like a, 
you know, quantum field theory treatment with weak under weak curvature. So under weak curvature, of course, you know, you can treat it, uh, I mean, curvature, uh, you can treat it effectively as a quantum field theory in a flat background, right, H mu nu, but there also the, the treatment can be fully um, uh, relativistic uh, and, and you can also treat the masses as, as quantum fields because it's just that it's, uh, you know, it's like a known states. It's, it's all particles are created here, or all particles are created there, right? So it's, a, it's not, it's very important to know that it's not a coherent state, not a BEC state. It's not A plus B whole to the power N. It's like A to the power N, and, you know, A dagger to the power N plus B dagger to the power N kind of thing. And uh, you can do everything. Pretty, so, so of course, uh, yeah, in, in, that, in that limit, in the weak field limit, you're, you're looking more like a Lorentz invariant treatment, which can be done. Uh, and then in, in uh, coming from general relativity, there is this treatment by Rovelli and uh, uh, Christodolo. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. There is so, also a paper by Marcus and others uh, of, of in a similar setting of gravitational wave emission. So I, I don't know whether Marcus wanted to mention that. So while I give our participants a last chance um, to raise their hands, um, let me maybe follow up on what Marcus said, because you were talking about the relativist. So if you would go to a quantum field theory researcher and you would ask her um, about where she would expect um, the sort of first quantum effects of gravity, they would probably, or she would probably say that um, she expects that there's a tree level contribution and then there's a sort of first loop contribution. And there, there, actually in Sugato's talk, there was also one point where you showed sort of Feynman diagrams that to me are fundamentally tree level. I mean, the ones that you showed were tree level. So is it just the sort of wrong way to think about this entanglement question from a tree level versus additional loop corrections perspective? So the additional loop corrections, as I said, are uh, there's either more H bar in the numerator so it's, it's multiplied by h bar. So the division by h bar advantage goes away, right? And and if it's a loop, there's more root g's, root capital g's. So 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 it is all all going the bad way. You see from observability. So that's the thing. So otherwise, you know, in principle, the experiment can, uh, you know, if 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 Marcus got even more decibels of squeezing, probably one can go to those. Uh, I mean, but you know, it is it is uh, either more square powers of square root of g in the numerator multiplied by more powers of h bar in the numerator so that is yeah i think this precise suppression is sort of where my uh, hesitancy of, of of believing sort of that there's a quantum field theoretic entanglement then comes from but of course i think i think the way to think about it is the other way around that you're excluding the possibility of a classical description yes exactly yes. if i yeah if, if, I, if I may add um, to that, so uh, again, a puristic approach, if you just take the experiment is exactly what you said, the experimental outcome is in case you see entanglement will be inconsistent with the assumption that you have a fixed metric. But this is a statement about um, a, a static um, uh, uh, property of the field. So there are no radiative components. You cannot make any statement about any field degrees of freedom. So this is now where you are, um, where the, the, the next uh, experiment of interest, okay? This is the next level. Next level um, uh, experiment of interest would be um, to, uh, an experiment that also involves field degrees of freedom, okay? So for example, that you then entangle your masses uh, via clocks, maybe two degrees of the field, such that um, you lose bipartite entanglement because you now entangle also with a field degree of freedom. And that that would be um, that would be the next story. But as Sugato said, eh, this will probably so this next level um, uh, of um, uh, uh, this next uh, level of excitement, let's call it, <laughs> will probably involve even much higher. Um, and and you need something that really couples to the uh, dynamicity of free, freedom. So probably a clock or so. If Thanks. I may just jump in, uh, I, I, if I understood Marcus correctly, you're talking about the uh, radiative degrees of freedom, the gravitons, right? That's yes. because uh, the notion of a degree of freedom in quantum gravity can mean a lot of different stuff. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's what I mean. I mean the radiative. Uh, so, yes, yeah, yes. Okay. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. 
So I'm making the analog to the to the uh, quantum electrodynamics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see no further hands raised, and I think we are already um, significantly over time. So before we um, thank our speakers one one last time, uh, let me announce that in four weeks from now, so on November nineteenth at six p.m., then um, after the time shift time. Um, we will have Julia Gubitosi and Nick Mavromatos talk about modifications of symmetries um, and move on to other quantum gravity topics. And so with that, um, let's all thank Marcos and Sugato again. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us. It was really great. Thanks very much. Thank you. And hopefully see you all in four weeks. <laughs>